Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for being so many already. Um, and uh, this is the first event in a new cycle called Conversations on Chinese Philosophy that we have organized together with the Ital Italian University in Dracolo. So me and Professor Chiara Ghidini uh, represent here the University of Naples at Orientale. As I said, this is the first of six events and we are very, very happy to start with a round table, not with an individual lecture, but with a round table on modern and contemporary Taiwanese philosophy. Uh, just uh, a couple of technical remarks before uh, asking uh, Professor Ghidini to introduce uh, today's event. Um, as, uh, as you know, you are kindly required to turn off your common mic just to give full visibility to the panel and also because of the big numbers of uh, today's event. Um, the event is being recorded, so it will be also available soon uh, on our social media. And uh, I will provide all participants a link where they can download and watch the video. And finally, uh, given the, um, the nature of today's event, so it's a round table, there will be a discussion moderated by uh, Professor Jana Roschker. So the Q&A session will take place virtually in our virtual classroom after the event. This is one of the positive aspects of Microsoft Teams. We have actually created a virtual classroom and um, so after the event you can interact directly with the speakers by sending them messages or tagging them or opening discussions freely here so i think we can also use this uh, feature uh, in order to uh, make this event even more interesting and um, and um, collective so uh, thank you very much uh, again, and please, Professor Ghidini, uh, introduce today's event, and we can start. Yes, thank you, Federico. So I almost silenced myself, trying, you know, to silence others. Uh, <laughs> first of all, welcome to everybody. Good morning and good afternoon for those of you who are either in Taiwan or anywhere else where it is already dark. I want to thank the co-organizers. Uh, Federico and Lisa for their wonderful and precious help for this set of conversations. And uh, I can see that there are a lot of students and also scholars coming from universities, uh, not only, of course, from the university where I teach, but also from Tallinn, from Ljubljana and more. Um, I'm particularly happy to introduce this first conversation on modern and contemporary Taiwanese philosophy. And of course, I would like to thank professors Jana Roschker, Li Minghui, Fabian Hubel, Wang Wangmin, and Dr. Wu Hueli. Uh, I will leave the honor to present the other participants at the round table uh, to Professor Roschker, but I will just uh, say a few words uh, just introducing Professor Roschker, who organized this wonderful roundtable for today. And uh, uh, the reason why I am particularly happy to introduce this one talk on uh, Taiwan is because I have an ongoing interest in uh, Taiwanese, uh, let's say, cultural history at large. And although I've been working in a joint project on something that actually is quite different and concerns the problematization of the notion of so-called folk healing or folk remedies and on the relationship between psychiatry and local forms of healing from a social and cultural history and medical anthropology perspective, focused mainly on Gassion and Wallen areas, I am also a teacher of East Asian philosophies. And so in this sense, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to listen to and to learn about the richness and creativity of Taiwanese philosophy. Professor Jana Roschker is a renowned sinologist. She works on Chinese philosophy, Chinese ethics, Chinese logic, uh, theory of knowledge, Chinese epistemology, I mean, uh, and on many other things. She's also the editor-in-chief of the famous academic journal Asian Studies. She's the founder of the European Association of Chinese Philosophy. And uh, it is indeed thanks to Jana and to other scholars if we have been granted easier access to the innovative philosophical systems emerged in Taiwan. 
This is because recently Yana edited a special issue on Taiwanese philosophy and the preservation of Chinese philosophical traditions. And just as recently, she also edited a volume on modern and contemporary Taiwanese philosophy, traditional foundations and new developments. And actually, I believe that some of the participants at the round table also contributed to this volume. Uh, actually, yesterday I also watched a conference uh, given, I think, for Beishada by uh, Yana on Chinese philosophy of life, relational ethics and the COVID-19. And uh, to me, I think it was very interesting. So I actually suggest that you watch it on uh, YouTube. It's about the relation between different models of ethics and their impact upon crisis solution strategies. And just uh, very recently, uh, Jana also published a book uh, uh, titled Becoming Human, Lisa Ho's Ethics, which uh, provides a thorough investigation of uh, Lisa Ho's moral philosophy and ethics. So without further ado, I do understand that you want to listen to the round table. So I'm leaving the floor to Professor Oscar. I just want to remind you to silence your microphones so that we have as little buffering as possible. And to remind you that uh, if we have time, uh, there will be uh, the chance to for the, you know, for your questions. And I'm sure that even if we don't have time, uh, all the participants at the round table will be more than happy to follow up on uh, your questions in the Q&A and A section. So I leave the floor to Jana, Jana to you for the start of the round table and thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Professor Giudini, for your extremely flattering introduction. <laughs> I'm really honored. And I would also like, of course, to start um, this round table um, by expressing my sincere gratitude uh, to the organizers of this round table, namely uh, yourself, Associate Professor Chiara Giudini and lecturer Dr. Federico uh, Brusadelli from La Orientale University of Naples and Associate Professor Lisa Indracola from Tallinn University. Of course, I'm also very much indebted to the speakers of today's uh, round table, of today's virtual meeting, uh, namely the Taiwanese scholars, uh, Professor Li Minghui, Professor Fabian Heubel, Professor Huang Kuanmin, and Associate Professor Wu Hui Ling, who I will introduce them more in detail a bit later just before their actual uh, speech. Uh, it is uh, my honor to have the opportunity to comment and to guide this round table, because I have been working on Taiwanese philosophy for the last two or almost three years, mainly in the framework um, of the research project um, on Taiwanese contemporary and modern and contemporary Taiwanese philosophy, which is supported by the Taiwanese Jiang Jingguo Foundation of uh, international scholarly exchange and the co-director of this project is Professor Li Minghui, who will also be the first speaker today. Um, <clears throat> as already mentioned, I'm really greatly honored and happy to host this virtual table. Um, and because several, with several important and influential Taiwanese scholars of philosophy, with whom I have been collaborating in different forms during different, uh, during many years uh, of pleasant and fruitful personal and academic uh, cooperation and exchange. And I would also like to use this opportunity to thank you all for this. So um, the participants of this round table will, dis will discuss about the definition, the role, the function, and the significance of modern and contemporary Taiwanese uh, philosophical research and its contributions to the further development of Chinese and Sinophon uh, philosophy, especially during the second half of the 20th and in the beginning of the 21st centuries. While the Chinese conceptual tradition, especially Confucianism, uh, fell out of favor from the 1950s onwards, uh, and was often banned or at least severely criticized uh, on the mainland, Taiwanese um, philosophers constantly strove to preserve and to develop it. 
Many of them tried to modernize their own traditions through dialogues with Western um, thought, especially with the ideas of the European Enlightenment. However, it was not only about preserving the Chinese philosophical tradition. In the second half of the 20th century, several complex and also coherent and innovative philosophical systems emerged in Taiwan. So the creation of these discourses is evidence for the great creativity and innovative power of many Taiwanese theorists whose work is still largely unknown in the Western world. However, before the particular speeches, I would also like to introduce some of the results of the aforementioned research uh, project Modern and Contemporary Taiwanese Philosophy. Many different articles and uh, several books have been published in the scope of this uh, project and under this topic. Um, Besides myself, uh, several other young scholars uh, have also contributed to the research work in the framework of the project. Here I could mention Te Theo Cernel, Assistant Professor Theo Cernel, who has mostly been researching the Taiwanese modern Confucian um, Xu Fuguan and his theory of aesthetics. His aesthetic theory is relatively unknown in the West also in also in uh, East Asian. Uh, then the associate professor Kang Byung Jung, who has helped us uh, to establish a rich database of papers and books on Taiwanese philosophy um, in South Korean university universities and research uh, institutes. And then Marco Ugrizek, who has worked on the East Asian reception and interpretation of Taiwanese um, philosophy, focusing on the respective intercultural uh, methodological work of the important Taiwanese scholar Huang Junjie, and also uh, mainly on Japanese sources. Uh, in this context, I would like uh, again to draw your attention, especially to two most recent uh, publications, um, which have, in spite of their um, recent coming out, uh, already ga gained a lot of attention um, of many international scholars. One is this uh, special issue on, uh, of uh, our journal Asian Studies <clears throat> on the topic of Taiwanese um, philosophy. And the other one is an edited volume entitled Modern and Contemporary Taiwanese philosophy, traditional foundations and new developments, which came out at the Cambridge Scholars Publishing um, House. Both of these publications uh, include articles or chapters written by all participants of this round table. In other words, all the participants of this round table have uh, contributed to these two um, publications. And that's why I would again like to thank them um, for their work, because, because uh, without them, all these achievements were not uh, be possible. But here I would also like to mention another book, which is far less influential, because it is written in Slovene language. But for me personally, uh, it is still interesting and not unimportant. Uh, this is my book, In the Shadow of Great Masters. The question of women in Chinese philosophy through the lens of two contemporary Taiwanese female philosophers, and one of them is sitting here today. This is uh, Wu Huiling, and the other one is the um, modern Confucian scholar um, um, Lin, uh, Lin, Professor Lin. Lin Yuehui. Lin Yuehui, of course. Lin Yuehui. <laughs> I'm so sorry. So, but um, I. This book has currently been translated into the English, and the English version will presumably be published in uh, the beginning of next year. So, and in autumn 2019, we have also organized an international conference um, on the uh, on the topic of Taiwanese philosophy in Ljubljana. And with the exception of Professor uh, Li Minghui, who is the co-director of the project and who has uh, therefore already visited Ljubljana several times on uh, previous other academic occasions. All other scholars who are uh, who will be talking to speaking today 
uh, who will be presenting their work today uh, were also participating um, in this event. And the keynote speaker was Professor Huang Kuanmin. So, but enough about our past achievements. We shall now rather lend our ears to some new aspect uh, of the topic in question. So, um, and we will start with a very elementary question, namely the question of how to define actually uh, Taiwanese philosophy. And this question will be discussed by Professor Li Minghui, uh, who is a distinguished research fellow at the Institute of Chinese Literature and Philosophy at the Academia Sinica in Taipei. Uh, Professor Li Ming, who is uh, a renewed, uh, internationally inf uh, very influential scholar, uh, who has um, obtained his PhD at the, in, in Germany at Bonn University. Um, it was entitled Das Problem des moralischen Gefühls in der Entwicklung der Kantischen Ethik, uh, which means the problem of the uh, moral feeling. Uh, in the uh, development of the Kantian ethics. Uh, he is also um, working a lot on uh, East Asian modern Confucianism, uh, and he is one of the most well-known experts on Kantian uh, philosophy in the entire East Asian region. Uh, he is also uh, he has also invested a lot of uh, very important and innovative work. Uh, in a dialogue between Kantian uh, metaphysics and especially Kantian moral philosophy and uh, classical Chinese philosophy, especially um, regarding Mencius uh, moral philosophy. So I am very happy that, um, that he will be um, our first speaker today, um, because the topic in itself, the topic of what is actually Taiwanese uh, philosophy, how to define it, is uh, in my view of utmost interest, because especially if we think about the fact that in international academia, it is not even clear whether there is such a thing as Chinese philosophy, since this basic issue has still not been satisfactorily uh, decided. <laughs> And since there is no consensus uh, about this question in international academia, we can certainly begin by asking ourselves whether there is such a thing as Taiwanese uh, philosophy. And if yes, how should we define it? So our first speaker, Professor Li Minghui, will elaborate upon these issues. Uh, Professor Li, the floor is yours. Please. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. yes. okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for, for your intro introduction. And I, today I, I, will, I will talk about the definition of Taiwanese philosophy. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, my colleague Lin Weijie, you, you know him, yeah? Lin Weijie and I, uh, participated in the research project on the philosophy in Taiwan in the past uh, 50 years, sponsored by the National Science Council uh, of, of Taiwan. And uh, we and uh, co-authored the, the section on comparative philosophy. The first problem we faced at that time was how to determine the scope of philosophical research in Taiwan. As the, the name suggests, philosophical research in Taiwan should refer to research of the philosoph philosophy researcher in Taiwan. But when we further consider which scholars should be included in the philosophical research in Taiwan, the problem became, uh, becomes some difficult. Uh, I have received a university education uh, in Taiwan, then studied in, the, in, the, in Germany. At the last, I returned to, to Taiwan uh, for long-term philosophical research and teaching. For people like me, this is not a problem. 
However, because Taiwan is not a closed society, and there are quite frequent, frequent international exchanges in academia, this issue becomes a bit complicated. Taking the modern new Confucianists who left the mainland China in, in 1949, Mo Zhongshan and the Xu Fuguan first taught in Taiwan and then taught in Hong Kong for a while. Mo Zhongshan returned, in, returned to Taiwan in his later years and, and lived in Taiwan until his days. Xu Fuguan traveled, uh, traveled between Hong Kong and Taiwan in his, his later years and, uh, and maintained close uh, contacts with ta Taiwanese academic circles. Qian Mu first taught in Hong Kong and then uh, transferred to Taiwan in, in his later years until his days. The most special example is Zhang Junmai. He was the drafter of the Constitution of the Republic of China. The China Democratic Socialist Party he founded moved to Taiwan with the Kuomintang in, in 1949. However, Zhang Junmai was uh, dis uh, dissatisfied with Chiang Kai-shek. So he only visited Taiwan once and gave lectures all, all, uh, all over the world the rest of his of the time, and finally died in the United States. But these people all agreed with the Republic of China politically, and most of, of their works were published in Taiwan, which had a great influence on Taiwan's society. In addition, after leaving mainland China in 1949, Lao Siguang uh, taught at the Chinese University of Hong Kong for a long time. After retiring, he transferred to Taiwan for teaching until he stays. Do these scholars belong to research in Taiwan? Uh, this is my question. Can their research results be regarded as the fr uh, fruits of Taiwan's academic circles? Uh, uh, in my in my generation, there are still some Hong Kong people who came to Taiwan to receive university education and then stayed in Taiwan to teach, such as Yang Zuhan, Li Ruiquan, and Chen Yichen. Conversely, there, there were also some Taiwanese who transferred to the West after uh, graduating from university, and even after teaching in Taiwan for a period of time, such as Du Weiming, Chen Zhongyin, Liu Suxian, and Fu Weixun. Liu Suxian and Fu Weixun later returned to Taiwan for teaching. Can their research results also be regarded as the fruits of Taiwan's academic circles? In, in the face of the above definition problem, we adopt the uh, broadest possible standard. As long as those who has, have been engaged in academic research and teaching in Taiwan for a long period of time, we will regard their research results as the fruits of Taiwan's academic circles. As for Du Weiming and Chen Zhongyin, we only consider their works published in Taiwan. As for Zhang Junmai, since most of his, his works was published in Taiwan, we also regard them as the fruits of Taiwan's academic circles. The situation is similar to Yu Yinshi in the history circle and uh, Zhang Ailin in the literary circle. Both Yun Shi and uh, Zhang Ailin did not settle in Taiwan, but most of their works was published in Taiwan. 
and they also profoundly influences Taiwan's historians and uh, literary, literary circles. Recently, a group of Taiwanese scholars ha have uh, tried to review the development of Taiwanese philosophy and establish a gene genealogy of Taiwanese philosophy. They have, have published two collections of essays namely existential engagement philosophy in Taiwan and uh, Jap the Japanese era edited by Hong Ziwei and, and another book, uh, Enlightenment and the Rebellion, uh, 100 Years of Taiwanese Philosophy edited by Hong Ziwei and uh, Deng Dunming. In the, in the later book, there are two essays which deal with the definition of Taiwanese philosophy, namely, whose, whose philosophy? How 100 years, the past and the future of Taiwanese philosophy by Hong Ziwei and the Gao Junhe and the, a, another paper on the subjectivity of Taiwanese philosophy by Chen Ruilin. Let me introduce the first paper, the so-called uh, 100 years of Taiwanese philosophy roughly traces the origin of Taiwanese philosophy to Li Chunsen, uh, 18, uh, 1838 to uh, 1924. A Christian thinker who crossed the Qin dynasty rule and the Japanese colonial rule I have spent 10 years editing five volumes of, of the works of Li Chunsen, as well as two collections of research papers, namely the sort of Li Chunsen and his time. And uh, Li Chunsen in the modern transformation of East Asia. The authors of the, the, of the first paper gave the, a definition of Taiwanese philosophy. So, the so-called, uh, quote, the so-called Taiwanese philosophy is defined here as the problem consciousness in the, conscious, in the context of Taiwan as the object of philosophical investigation. Or also the problem consciousness is universal in human beings, but the answers and the methods are unique. They also mentioned the three genealogies of Taiwanese philosophy. The first genealogy re represents the official position of the Kuomintang, which regards Taiwanese philosophy as a continu continuation of traditional Chinese philosophy. The second, second genealogy is uh, proposed by Liao Renyi. In his op opinion, the philosophical tradition established by Taiwan in, in the Japanese colonial era was replaced by Chinese philosophy after the Second, Second World War. The third gene gene uh, uh, gene genealogy is the so-called dual source two-stage theory proposed by Yang Rubin Quote, the dual source refers to the two cultural and academic traditions of China and, the Jap and, Japan, and Japan. Before uh, 1949, the dual source existed in main, mainland China and Taiwan uh, separately. And after 1949, the dual source converged in Taiwan, quote uh, end. For the author of this paper, the above three gen genealogies has limitations and uh, cannot present the full picture of Taiwanese philosophy. And, uh, and, and they 
they put forward the so-called multiple competing theory. According to this theory, Taiwanese philosophy is the result of the multiple development development of Chinese philosophy, Japanese philosophy, and the Western philosophy. Uh, now to the, to the second paper. Uh, in his paper, Chen Weilin emphasizes that Taiwanese philosophy must presuppose the subjectivity of Taiwanese philosophy uh, community. In short, the Taiwanese philosophical community must establish his subjectivity through the process of, of self-formation and self-construction. On the one hand, this thesis echoes the definition of Taiwanese philosophy in the first paper. And on the, on, on the other hand, it makes the problem more complicated. Uh, in my talk, I only want to briefly introduce the current discussions about Taiwanese philosophy in Taiwan's academic circles, but cannot go deep into the complicated issues because the relevant thinking involves the co co complex dis disputes over Taiwan's current uh, cultural identity and the political identity, and left many questions to be uh, clarified. Mm -hmm. if, if you are interested in this issue, uh, please refer to the, on the Sichuan Scholars of Taiwanese Philosophy, published by Hong Ziwei in Philosophy East and the West in, uh -huh. uh, in, in, 20, in 2019. Uh, uh, okay. okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Limigo. It is really a pity that we only have 15 or till 20 minutes for one speaker because it is really difficult to address so many complex uh, questions as you have now raised in this short amount of time. But um, we have a plural. <laughs> round table, so we will proceed um, with our second speaker, who is Professor Fabian Heubel, also a research member at uh, Academia Sinica. Uh, Professor Heubel um, has obtained his uh, PhD at the Techni um, Technical University Darmstadt, um, and his dissertation was about um, late Foucault and the idea of a critical theory of self-cultivation. Um, recently in Taiwan, he is mainly dealing with uh, transcultural Zhuangzi studies and um, also his uh, other research, his many research uh, interests also uh, include um, critical theory, contemporary German and French thought, interpretations of Chinese philosophy in Western Sinology, contemporary Chinese philosophy and philosophy of art. And um, Fabian uh, will be introducing uh, actually the, um, the contribution he has published in one of our common um, publications in the special issue on Asian studies, um, namely, <clears throat> He will talk about um, transcultural Zhuangzi studies in Taiwan, um, in contemporary Taiwan, which is also a very interesting uh, topic, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and but um, regretfully, we only have 15 till 20 minutes. I hope that Fabian will still be able to point to the main um, main main contents or main messages uh, contained in his um, contribution. Um, Fabian, the floor is yours, please. Can you hear me? So thank you, Jana, for this introduction. Thanks to the organizers. I will talk about, or I will focus in this short amount of time on one 
philosopher from Taiwan uh, on uh, Yang Rubin, who is uh, a specialist in Confucianism, but also in Taoism and many other topics. And I will discuss his notion of subjectivity. So I will focus my short time on this topic, but I will also mention the relation of his research to contemporary Neo-Confucianism. And I would like to start with this aspect. Contemporary Neo-Confucianism has in principle recognized democracy and science as universal achievements of mankind that are not only compatible with Confucianism, but should in fact be assimilated to allow it to fulfill its historical role. However, this recognition of democracy and science entails a problem which makes it understandable why Yang Rubin has turned to reflections on the Zhuangzi and an idea which he calls wandering subject, Yoji Juti, to criticize some basic assumptions of contemporary Neo-Confucianism. The possibility of a reconciliation between inner holiness, Nei Sheng, a model of subjectivity oriented towards the ideal of the holy person, Sheng Ren, and new external kingliness, Xin Wai Wang, namely democratic politics, is based on the assumption that the conception of moral subjectivity de developed in the idealist school of the heart, Xin Xue, of Song Ming Confucianism, can provide the necess 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 necessary conditions to open Chinese thought up for democracy and science. Although this turn from the tradition of the way to democracy and science would not be an easy one, but would be accompanied by what Mo Zongtan calls a broken and complex way of communication, Qu Tong. The difficulties to democratize subjectivity and to open it towards a scientific spirit of criticism and experiment have been largely neglected and underestimated in contemporary Neo-Confucianism. Here, Young's idea of a wandering subject or of an energetic transformative subject, Qi Hua Zhu Ti, inspired by the Zhuangzi, provides a fresh perspective which challenges not only the basic assumptions of contemporary Neo-Confucianism, but also dominant conceptions of subjectivity in the West. In Yang Rubin's reflections, therefore, important philosophical problems correspond to the ability to unfold the specific transcultural potential accumulated after 1949 in Taiwan. His way of exploring this possibility carries in itself the potential to attract attention well beyond the limits of a regional experience or a particular language. In my paper, I speak in great length about the historical background of transcultural philosophy in Taiwan, but I will not have time today to uh, go into this discussion. So please, uh, refer to my paper if you want to know more about this aspect. So I will talk now about a rather complex and maybe yeah, specific philosophical problem that is the structure of subjectivity in Yang Rubin's understanding. I call this the triadic subject. Is this, this is my question, an alternative paradigm of subjectivity? Yang Rubin is a prolific white writer and his many books cover a wide range of topics. Instead of giving a general overview of his work, I will focus on his concept of the subject, because this is, in my understanding, the philosophical heart of his response to the crisis of contemporary Neo-Confucianism. The wandering subject, Yoji Juti, is the title of a paper Yang Rubin published in 2014. 
It was republished in 2016 as the third chapter of his book, Zhuangzi as Confucian, Ruman Nade Zhuangzi. The idea of a wandering subject helps to understand from which perspective Yang Rubin enters into the relation between the Zhuangzi and the problem of subjectivity, namely the well-known claim of Western philosophers and some sinologists that subjectivity is lacking in the Chinese philosophical tradition. So Yang Rubin clearly affirms the notion of subjectivity in the context of contemporary Chinese and Taiwanese philosophy. Throughout his discussion, Yang Rubin contrasts his perspective with three other notions of the subject. One well known in the Chinese context, the other two popular in contemporary Western philosophy, namely Xin Xing Zhu Ti and Shen Ti Zhu Ti, which may be translated as spiritual subject uh, and bodily subject. And furthermore, there is Yi Shu Yi Shi Zhu Ti, conscious subject or subject of consciousness. To understand the idea of a spiritual subject, Xin Xing Zhu Ti, this is of course a bad translation, maybe somebody knows a better one. One has to keep in mind that it has been crucial for the attempt of contemporary Neo-Confucianism to modernize Confucian learning through the reception and transformation of Kantian philosophy and post-Kantian German idealism. Philosophers like Mo Zong San and his followers were strongly convinced that only this paradigm of spiritual or idealist subjectivity provided Chinese modernization with the normative root it desperately needed in order to overcome the destructive consequences of a purely instrumental learning from the West. And of course, of a socialist modernization, which for Mo Zong San has no deep roots in Chinese tradition and therefore is not only perceived as lacking normative legitimation, but also as necessarily short lived. For him, only the spiritual subject, Xin Xin Zhu Ti, can constitute the metaphysical foundation for what he has called the moral subject, Dao De Zhu Ti, and furthermore, for opening up to science and democracy without losing the necess necessary rootedness in Confucian tradition. This proposed fusion of the heart learning Xin Xue of Neo-Confucian teaching with German idealism was mainly developed after 1949 in Hong Kong and in Taiwan. Within the ideological framework of the Cold War, this approach aimed at providing a philosophical critique of Marxism in general and the rule of the Communist Party over the Chinese mainland in particular. Qi, uh, translated here as breath energy or energy, and the breath energy learning qi xue of Confucianism has been at least since the beginning of the 20th century linked to the materialist reconstruction of Chinese philosophy and to the reception of dialectical materialism in China. It is therefore of major importance that Yang Rubin, who is intellectually and emotionally deeply attached to the academic context of contemporary Neo-Confucianism, not only defends the distinction between the energy school qi xue and the heart school qin xue, but also tries to show that the idealist insistence on a spiritual subject is not only theoretically one-dimensional, but also normatively problematic. Drawing on the Zhuangzi and the motif of wandering or rolling, Yang Rubin opens up a discussion which leads to a new understanding of a possible linkage between modern democracy and the reconstruction of classical Chinese sources. 
Young Rubin introduces, and this is the heart of his conception of the subject, a triadic structure constitu constituted by a material, an energetic and a spiritual moment, xin qi shen in Chinese. This conceptual framework is not only important for Yang Rubin's reading of the Zhuangzi, but was already an important aspect in his 1996 influential book on the Confucian concept of the body, Ru Jia Shen Ti Guan, especially for his interpretation of the book Mengzi. So this idea of the subject is not only important or does not only derive from the Zhuangzi, but is also crucial for his understanding of Confucianism. He notes that each of the three moments, Xing Qi Shen, is intertwined with the other two, constituting a responsive constellation, which is more dynamic than the dualist structure of body and mind dominating the Western paradigm of subjectivity. It is the system of breath energy, qi de qi xi, which enters into a dyadic subjectivity and makes it breathe, so to say, in constant change, turning around in a very literal sense, since Yang Rubin also refers to the potter's wheel, Tao Jun, in terms of Zhuang of resting in the middle of heaven, the potter's wheel. To explain the balance of heaven, the potter's wheel turns around a spinning center, a moving hub or axis, thus being at the same time relatively stable at its center. This is a figure or metaphor, as Yang Rubin says, at the heart of his discussion of the material, energetic, spiritual, threefold structure of the subject. But how are we to understand the relation between the triadic subject and this paradoxical figure of standing and moving at the same time? What distinguishes this triadic subject from a dyadic conception of subjectivity is a moment of betweenness, which enters the relation between the material and spiritual, between body and mind, between matter and soul. In the Chinese tradition, Yang Rubin refers to this third moment is called qi. There is an endless discussion about how to translate qi and whether it is translatable at all, I will skip the, trans, the, the discussion of this problem. And now we'll turn to some uh, final uh, remarks. In what Yang Rubin calls the material energetic spiritual subject, Xing Qi Shen, the energetic moment is placed at the center. It is the common ground of both material form and spirit. This makes sense because in this triadic model, qi is intimately linked to transformation, namely to energetic transformation, qi hua. In Yang Lubin's understanding, qi can transform into form xing and become formed material energy xing qi, but it can also transform into spirit shen and become spiritual energy, shen qi. Qi is thus at the center of the subject as a spinning hub. It is the epitome of turning movement and pulsation, but also a comparatively stable standpoint in the midst of change. The central position of breath energy is an important reason for naming this paradigm of subjectivity the energetic transformative subject, qi hua zhu ti, as Yang Rubin calls it. Although it is hard to deny that this translation is problematic and that the term makes much more sense in Chinese than in English.
this turning or spinning movement is a paradoxical transformation in non-transformation and a non-transformation in transformation to become aware of and realize this structure of transformation this standing in change is what Yang Rubin calls true wandering or perfect wandering it is surprising that Yang Rubin also introduces terms such as heavenly wandering or wandering transformation to speak about a layer in the Zhuangzi with aesthetic as well as mythical implications. The cultivation of the ability of a subject to wander freely and creatively through the three moments of its internal structure leads to a transformational level of perfection. From this perspective, it becomes clearer how Yang Rubin tries to introduce the theory of qi, of breath energy, in a way that avoids a materialist or naturalist reductionism that was very influential throughout the 20th century. So here is his critical stance within contemporary Chinese philosophy, a stance which is intimately linked to a very much influenced influenced by Taiwanese experience experience perspective on Chinese philosophy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabian. <laughs> Again, such a complex topic, but you made it on time. And uh, I have um, actually the presentation was uh, very intriguing, even, even if I know the um, article on which it is based. And uh, I would have a lot of questions, but regretfully, I don't think we will be able to raise them directly, maybe afterwards. But let's proceed to our next speaker. This is Professor Juan Quan Min, also from a research fellow at the Academia Sinica in Taiwan. Uh, he has obtained his PhD in uh, Paris, Sorbonne. Um, writing on Schelling uh, and the crisis of uh, modern metaphysics. He's also uh, very much well-known and influential in Eastern Asia, but also partly more and more increasingly in the West with uh, his studies on phenomenology. And recently he also became interested and has invested a lot of work into the research of um, of uh, modern new Confucianism, Xin Rujia. So he was also introducing in his keynote speak at our conference um, his view um, of a comparison between Mo Zong San and Tang Junyi. But uh, today he will be presenting uh, something else, namely he will be talking of a more general topic connected to Taiwanese philosophy and his uh, speech uh, is entitled The Philosophy uh, of and in Transformation in Taiwan, Embodiment and Effect. So, um, please, Professor Huang, uh, you have the floor for 15 till 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, please unmute yourself. We, we don't hear you. You, you have to un... Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I will share the, the my PowerPoint. Can I uh, do this? Federico, can he Have share you seen the, the PowerPoint? I try to... No, uh, sorry. Yeah, have you Chiara, seen? I think, Chiara, I think I have to authorize uh, yeah. our yeah. guest, but I, can, can you do that for me? Because I don't yeah. see any specific. I try to do it again. Uh, 
Okay. okay. My my paper is on uh, more um, more generally on the uh, phenomenon of uh, philosophical uh, research in in Taiwan. Uh, I will focus on uh, this uh, development of philosophy as, uh, in transformation. And uh, I, I try to, to uh, focus on two perspectives, uh, namely embodiment and uh, effect. My, in, in my uh, opinion, I, I think uh, modern or contemporary uh, Chinese philosophy is a kind of a comparative philosophy. And in, in this sense, uh, one cannot escape from the um, general comparison of the concepts uh, from different uh, tra tradition. And so I, uh, I will challenge the uh, presupposition of uh, the uh, independent development of uh, philosophy uh, either in China or in Europe uh, from uh, Greek time. So the first question about uh, th this problem of uh, comparative philosophy is uh, we should ask uh, whether there is a mutual influence or only in independent development in past times. And I will say that um, uh, one should focus on the, the problem of translation. Uh, uh, doing philosophy and mainly uh, in a comparative uh, perspective, we should uh, pay attention to the translation of concepts. And uh, I, we know that the, the uh, Chinese philosophy <laughs> as uh, 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 status quo uh, is a result of uh, many layers of translation. Uh, one layer is the in interlingual translation, mainly from Greek and the Latin terms into Chinese characters, or uh, another is intralingual translation, uh, namely from classical Chinese terms into modern terms. So we can, uh, based on these two uh, sorts of translation to uh, deal with the dialogue and compa comparison, uh, we should uh, evoke a double interrogation that ladies inside each context and across contexts. Inside uh, each context, for example, in uh, Western wars, we should uh, treat with the concepts such, such as ethos, uh, logos, uh, aletheia in Greek or transcendental from uh, Latin to uh, modern uh, philosophical terms. And in Chinese, uh, context, we should uh, treat the concepts such as ren, uh, benevolence, xing, natural essence, or dao, uh, principle, or qi, as uh, Fabian uh, has, has uh, talked, qi as uh, vital force or energy, etc. And in that sense, uh, we must ask a possibility of the uh, translation across uh, contexts from uh, from uh, Western uh, context into the Chinese context, we we will pick some terms to uh, describe ethos or logos, but there is no single uh, perfect translation of it. And also for Ren, uh, maybe it can be translated into benevolence or into humanness, etc., or charity, etc. So uh, this double interrogation is the the most uh, uh, important task. 
of comparative philosophy in doing Chinese philosophy. And we should also pay attention to the written forms of alphabets and ideogram. We all know that the Chinese uh, characters are uh, originated from um, ideograms. So it's the, the uh, structure and the, the structure of sentences are quite uh, different from the Western uh, sentences uh, based on alphabetic uh, constitutions. So uh, these differences uh, is also a, a background of consciousness in doing uh, comparative philosophy, but which means uh, Chinese philosophy uh, in um, East Asian context. But also, uh, if we not only focus on the ancient texts, we also uh, try to uh, write uh, uh, modern contemporary uh, philosophical paper uh, text, we should pay more attention to the propositional and, argument and argumentative demand, which is uh, based uh, from the logical structure in uh, Western uh, style. So I, I will uh, pass to the future, uh, the feature of comparative Chinese philosophy. In my sense, I will say that doing Chinese, uh, doing comparative philosophy in Chinese language is uh, the least uh, characteristic uh, for uh, doing Chinese philosophy uh, in Taiwan. And uh, there are some uh, uh, requisites for it. First is a connection with traditions. And we are very conscious of the multiple uh, traditions, as I mentioned uh, in, in, in last um, paragraph. And, but we are forming a new chiasma. That chiasma is the, the, uh, the, uh, the basis of creativity in, uh, in nowadays academic uh, circle in philosophy. And, but we also orient, orient ourselves for the future. So the philosophy is not uh, only the results of the uh, past uh, um, uh, heritage. It must uh, be connected from the past uh, through us, to, through the present, to the future. Now, so this is the, the connection with traditions, with different traditions. And the second record is, is the connection with humanity and the nature. But uh, in this sense, I will mean that we are setting framework for doing comparative Chinese philosophy. And uh, in Chinese context, we will uh, combine the thinking and acting. There is no uh, absolute separation of uh, thought and action. And uh, in another uh, perspective, uh, we will see that uh, uh, Chinese people in the past time, the ancient Chinese philosophers, they tend to give a, a anthropomorphic uh, idea of the universe and uh, of the humanity. And uh, they are uh, very uh, often some uh, discourses on animism. So I propose to transform uh, this old form uh, or primitive form of anthropomorphism or animism to pass to a more uh, open uh, dialogue for nowadays. And uh, thirdly, we are meeting the humanity in transformation. And this is the text I will uh, mention uh, in the second part of my discourse. And for uh, transformation, I will say uh, in Chinese it's hua or zhan hua, as uh, Fabian also has uh, mentioned. But uh, I'm talking about more on the transformation of concepts. Just as translation of concepts, we are transforming concepts from another from uh, Western uh, context to uh, Chinese context. And so, uh, but also mutually, 
when we are translating uh, Chinese terms into the Western context, we are uh, doing the transformation of concepts. But in doing this kind of conceptual uh, translation, there is also a possibility of transformative humanity. And so for Chinese, you will say, oh, we are doing the cultivation or self-cultivation. But in fact, it, we are in the process of becoming. And that uh, process of becoming is a kind of uh, embodiment, mm -hmm. which is not uh, just a uh, 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 separation from one moment to another moment, lays a basis uh, uh, of body and flesh. And so we, we will say uh, lays a transitive uh, formation, uh, which is based on education or learning, and we should uh, focus also on concept and uh, conception. Uh, I use the conception as a, 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 a literal sense and metaphorical sense because conception, which also means a woman uh, conceived who uh, carries a baby uh, in her in her body, so. Uh, the ancient uh, Chinese character is uh, expresses also the the same uh, this same idea, which means body is not just a, a, a trunk; it is a, a living uh, body in in uh, this uh, structure. So, uh, if we take this uh, literal sense of conception, we will say the conceptual uh, transformation means also a corporal uh, or bodily uh, comprehension. So that it is the uh, understanding as embodiment. And I, I will uh, also pass to another uh, feature that uh, Chinese uh, philosophers will uh, focus also on the solitude in nature and which in comparison to the constant uh, becoming. So there is no uh, steady and uh, a fixed figure of human being. And mm -hmm. so we, we are meeting the problem of transformation uh, from one form to another form. And so in that sense, we are uh, testing the boundary. Now, the problem of boundary is uh, surely important in uh, this idea of uh, transformation. And uh, if we pass to the concrete cases of uh, transformation, uh, seeing Chinese ph philosophy itself is in uh, translation. I will take some uh, example, uh, especially from contemporary uh, Confucian philosophers such as uh, Xiong Shi Li and uh, Tang Junyi, Tang Junyi, and uh, Mo Zhongshan. Uh, Xiong Shi Li is the, the re uh, representative uh, philosopher who, uh, who combines the principle of becoming from Yi Jing and Buddhist uh, terminology. Uh, Tang Jun, uh, he is more uh, taking a Hegelian model. Uh, Mo Zhongshan, he uh, more, uh, as uh, Li Minghui may, may, uh, and uh, Yana has uh, talked, he is more uh, uh, adopting the Kantian model. Uh, in Xiong Shili's, uh, idea, the, the main uh, thought is that he uh, adapt a very ancient uh, Confucian principle uh, as the one body. And he uh, used uh, a, a diction of uh, Chen Hao, the man of Ren forms one body with all things without any differentiation, or uh, this is the translation of uh, uh, Wenzi Chan, Chen Rongjie, or another uh, translation is that humanness is being completely one with things. Uh, this is also a diction we can find uh, in Wang Yangming. And uh, in Chen Hao, he used this uh, metaphor of one body to, uh, to uh, connect with a medical met metaphor. Uh, he said that um, the paralysis of limbs uh, as being without feeling. And so it is a kind of antipathy. And, but on the other way, 
the the uh, Confucian idea is focused on the bodily um, sympathy or empathy. So use this analogy. He uh, the the Confucians uh, tend to treat the other as oneself to take the other's body uh, as similar to my body. So there is uh, uh, embodiment of moral feeling and also uh, politics on uh, this kind of uh, metaphysical, uh, metaphysical presupposition is the same. One should uh, apply principle of benevolence to the varying uh, situations, letting all beings, letting all things achieve their own completeness so that everything is in its own place. And uh, so let, this is uh, the, the main idea of Xiong uh, Shi Li. Tang Jun, he is more uh, taking uh, the idea from uh, the book of Becoming, Yi Jing, and he tried to say, to explain that the mutual action of Qian and Kun uh, is this uh, process of uh, effective communication, or we can translate it, uh, we can translate it, um, it uh, into empathic communion uh, in Chinese, Gan Tong, as the principle of influence and response. So there is a mutual reaction. Uh, there is a responding process uh, which manifests not only the phenomena of natural world, but also of moral world. And uh, according to Tang Junyi, this is a, a dynamic picture of the universe. The reason of existence of one thing lies in its reaction to the influence of other things. The more one thing can fear the other thing in order to react to it, the richer the property this, this thing can behold and show its own create, create creativity. And this dynamic breakthrough of the limitation by way of the uh, effective communication is in face of the limit or boundary set by the others. And uh, mutual action means also a mutual patient. Uh, there is a passivity and negation. So a uh, moral feeling of human empathy indicates the effectivity of the dynamics. Uh, this is the way I connect the embodiment and the effect. Benevolence is the manifestation of the effect by which humanity communicates with other creatures in the world. And uh, Tang Jun offers his uh, axiological inter interpretation as such. Human heart mind as the core of personality does fear in an empathic way. Human passion is active in the sense that it relates human uh, moral action in analogy to cosmic dynamics. And in responding to um, to uh, the uh, different uh, boundaries set by the other, we can see um, there are development of different uh, dimensions, such as the affection inside oneself. He called it uh, self-affection. Uh, and uh, there is affection between one and the other. So this is a uh, hetero affection. I adapt, adapt uh, this term from uh, Michel Onhi uh, and uh, Jacques Dehita, uh, John uh, Brignon And the, there is uh, also a response to the heavenly call, uh, which is uh, destination, Tianming uh, Zhi And also, uh, one should care for the disappearance of the past generations. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, connection with all the dead people. And in modern science, um, model, uh, metaphysics, he adapted almost uh, the same term as Gan Tong uh, from the old tra uh, tradition. And there is a more um, influence of vitalism in uh, modern science uh, discourse. And he, he thinks that every living being is a manifestation of the universal uh, vital force. And the feeling of life in moral bene benevolence is the pivot of the uh, natural life and the moral life. And he called this moral metaphysics. And this mo moral metaphysics is based on creativity.
I will skip uh, all the rest of uh, his idea of uh, onto cosmology and, and yeah, just. Professor Huang, uh, yeah. I'm so sorry to to um, to interrupt your exciting and interesting uh, speech, but um, the 20 minutes are over basically. So I would like to ask you uh, if you could um, slowly um, give us some concluding remarks uh, so we can proceed to the last speaker of this round table. And I still sincerely hope we will have some some time for a debate uh, in the end. Thank you. So please, just uh, a few concluding remarks, if possible. Yeah, yeah. I, I would just uh, uh, like to adapt uh, those ideas to uh, shift to the contemporary situation. The one one thing is the, uh, the um, idea of uh, vulnerability of nature. And the second thing is the vulnerability of uh, society. And for uh, these two terms, I, I think they are also uh, linked to the um, uh, embodiment and uh, effective communication. And so I, I, I think my, my, my conclusion will be focused on the crisis of humanity in and after the pandemic, uh, which is also one of my, my concern in, in, um, in connecting the um, traditional uh, Chinese philosophy to um, the Taiwanese philosophy in uh, development nowadays. And I will just mention the problem of uh, new frontier and the problem of uh, truth making and the dilemma of Anthropocene and also the problem of the uh, equality and freedom. Now, this is, uh, all these are the problems I think uh, we should deal with in during the, the crisis of humanity. Yeah, so uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry for uh, such a long uh, talk. Thank you so much, Professor Huang. Yes, I also think I completely agree. I think that questions uh, regarding the current global crisis should be of our common uh, concern, and we should all be dealing with them through the through the lens of what we are doing in Chinese and comparative and post-comparative philosophy. But let us, we are really tight um, uh, in, with the time. So let us continue with our fourth uh, speaker. Uh, she is uh, the only female speaker uh, at this round table and on, also the youngest one. Uh, Wu Huiling, she is an assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy at the Furen Catholic uh, University. Her PhD uh, was obtained at the National Central University in Taiwan. Um, and uh, her doctoral dissertation was on Ji Kang and the rise of Zhuangzi school in the Wei Jin period, in the early medieval period. And now she is still, her research uh, interest mainly lie uh, in Taoism, both classical uh, Taoism, such as Laozi and Zhuangzi, but also Neo-Taoism from the Weijin period, uh, particularly uh, Ji Kang, uh, is in the center of her interest. But today she will be uh, talking about Laozi and um, about some epistemological questions uh, in Laozi, namely, uh, she will be um, speaking on knowledge and ignorance in Laozi. Please, uh, Hui Ling, uh, the floor is yours for 15 till 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor Yana's introduction about me, uh, and I'm very honored to participate to this roundtable. And um, but uh, I just only uh, participate in this roundtable for last week. <laughs> so maybe <laughs> to join this uh, roundtable, I can focus not only focus on the Taiwanese philosophy. Uh, I want to more focus on the Chinese philosophy. Maybe it was uh, more uh, fit my Major. Okay, I pre um I just uh, prepare my print uh, my PP, my PowerPoint. So let me do. Give me a few minutes. Uh, sorry. Okay, about. Okay. 
can you see about this? Okay, can you see very closely? Okay, um, the title I want to share is uh, the, about the knowledge and uh, ignorance on the Laozi. So uh, that was about me, <laughs> very uh, short introduction. And I thought maybe I can join this round table because I just graduated the uh, Graduate Institute of Philosophy, National Century University. Why? Because uh, Professor Yang Rubin, uh, Professor Li Ra Li Chen was um, my professor. They were uh, uh, teaching on the National Central University. So I thought maybe I can join uh, this round table because of that. And uh, the other uh, reason, maybe just uh, because uh, uh, my uh, uh, my doctoral uh, advice is Professor Chen Guing. So I thought he must be close to the Thai, uh, Taiwanese philosophy. Uh, so uh, I want to share about this. Uh, about a very short introduction about uh, the Laozi, this book, and uh, about the philosophy of Laozi. Uh, follow this uh, thought, I will uh, follow the, uh, the recording of uh, his rain state, and uh, it was very short uh, introduction about uh, philosophy, this Laozi. And uh, as we can know about the Laozi's uh, information, and uh, he, we know he know, uh, wrote this book, uh, just uh, Laozi. Maybe we can call it Dao De Jing too. And uh, uh, there was uh, the, this little book is a huge influence our Chinese philosophy. When we understand the Chinese philosophy, all our religion, over government, art, medicine, even the cooking. So I do a very. Uh, <laughs> I thought I can hope that uh, most uh, people can understand about the Laozi's influence, huge influence, especially even the cooking. Uh, and uh, you can see about uh, the art, religion, and the medicine. And now uh, follow, uh, that was a very short introduction, so I could want to uh, just go back to the today why I want to why I want to share this topic. This topic is the discovery about the knowledge and uh, ignorance. Why well, uh, that was basic uh, my uh, research uh, of the more recently years, and uh, especially the other uh, question about this is about uh, due to the certain news. The news is epidemic in uh, 2020 uh, because 2020 is, has changed the most people's life. What news? The news is in 2020, um, people. We have certain, we cancel the more grouped activity, <clears throat> sorry, um, to avoiding the expansion of the uh, epidemic. <clears throat> However, it's have a, maybe we have to cancel so many grouped activity, but uh, there was something different change, something change because uh, the academic uh, academic has given the piece of the sea area from the Hong Kong to the Pera River, is, which is allowed the white dolphin can return to there uh, where they already used to activity. So this news was uh, let me to think about it. Maybe we always think we know something, but uh, is it true? Is it really we know something or is we can know something? So follow this thought, I will just think about it at least. Just can people uh, unbear knowledge from other uh, conscious? And uh, the other question is uh, how can we define our knowledge is always correct. In fact, uh, lots of all the time to uh, discussion about uh, we really can understanding everything. So uh, follow this thought. So I. Uh, we can go to the uh, chapter uh, 25. Uh, about uh, this question is I want to answer the uh, conscious of a human being and this uh, uh, interpretation about uh, the something we cannot know, something we cannot know. So uh, this chapter uh, lots of says, there was something um, different and yet complete, which existed before the heaven and earth soundless and formless, it depends nothing and does not change. If appearance everywhere is free from danger, it may consider the 
model of the universe. It does know its name, I call it doubt. And uh, it first to give it its name, I should it call it rate. So follow this chapter and uh, we can see all the uh, uh, Chinese test. Uh, um, that was a very uh, important sentence. It's about uh, um, what your last means, some point about this chapter. Um, the point is uh, the Dao is on different and yet conflict. And uh, secondary, and uh, he, uh, chapter 22 wanted to let us to know Dao is uh, substantive. Thing is, in formula is uh, are, are relative, but Dao is different. So and uh, the second and the uh, secondary uh, Dao is a soundless and a formless. So we didn't know his name. So we can uh, understanding really conflictly. So we just force it to give his name. So uh, follow this chapter, we can say uh, something we couldn't know. So and uh, Dao is existed before heaven and earth in the time and uh, generally everything. So it's a uh, uh, Dao is before like everything exists. And uh, next, uh, Dao and uh, everything is a circle conception. Why is it about this question? Maybe we can follow the next chapter, can answer this question. And uh, uh, next point uh, is about the great. Great is why uh, Lao Tzu say I will call it great because uh, great can explain the breadth and uh, the invented and the uh, extension of uh, about the piece. So uh, about the this chapter, we can uh, see the Lao Tzu want to reflect on the consciousness of the human being. Uh, as like that, we can see uh, Lao Tzu want to say something we can know. And so we, we can know anything. No. So Lao Tzu want to say, but uh, something we can know. So we can follow the chapter two. It's really famous uh, chapter, and uh, it's one of the, my 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 favorite. Okay, uh, follow the Lao Tzu's thought, and uh, he say, when the people of the world all know beauty as beauty, and uh, they rise to recognize of ugly, uh, when they all know good as good, they rise to the Connotation of evil, landfall being and non being produce each other, difficulty and easy compare each other, long and short construct each other, high and low distinguish each other, sound and voice harmony each other, um, four and back follow each other. So, and uh, what they want to to say? What can we know? And we can uh, follow the Chinese. Test and uh, the Tinsha Jiji Wei Mei, yeah, and something like that. So maybe uh, you already know that. So maybe we can go back to the next. Uh, about the list chapter, uh, Lao Tzu want to highlight a very important uh, uh, point about uh, the obsession conception. Uh, as we can see, beauty and ugly, good and evil, being and evil, difficult and easy, long and short. There's so many opposite conception. And what do you want to say? You want to say the, uh, the focus on the connection between the opposite conception. So we can, less we can know. We can know the about the connection. Uh, something like uh, you can only say long, always long. No, it was uh, long and the shoulder have uh, some connection. And uh, those connection can involve the lore of the world. So Lao Tzu want to, he believes a lot everything is a uh, phenomena, is uh, changeable and uncertain. And uh, the opposite conception, it can explain this change. Um, something like the, um, we can see the uh, yin and yang, or we can see the four season, yes, spring, summer, less so. So all the conception and, and the most important things you want to highlight, all the conception and the value on, and are artificial. So people should not be upset with the, some pursuit of certainly concept or some value. So uh, we can see the 
Lao Tzu want to say we know something that is opposite conception. So it's not only chapter two, it's only be, maybe like some chapter uh, 28 uh, about the man and female. Over the chapter uh, 36, especially uh, 36, uh, because the list, uh, this chapter uh, allows us to say the weakness and the tender come over the hand and uh, the strong, the heart. This uh, chapter I want to say the very uh, opposite conception about uh, the weak, tender, and the uh, heart and the strong. Yeah, but uh, that was very important thing is that Lao Tzu want to promote it to the weak and the tender. And he, he believed that the weak and tender could be more extinct strength. Why like he want to discussion about that? Maybe we can see the grace. The grace, maybe he's small, he's weak, he's tender, but uh, he can not be easily uh, uh, brought down by the strong wind. So, Maybe it was last one to talk about that. Uh, especially uh, on the other chapter, it's chapter 14. It's a really famous uh, chapter, especially Fan Zhe Dao Zhe Dong. Reversion is the uh, action of Dao. Um, so Lao Zi want to uh, highlight the uh, reversion. Reversion is very important to uh, say about uh, the change of this word. And uh, also the chapter uh, very famous uh, chapter uh, 58. Chapter 58, he said the climb is opt which uh, happiness depends. Happiness is a lot in which calamity in the landing. So that was it means uh, uh, something you have to see that was the bad things. That was the bad thing, but uh, maybe it was the opposite, the good things behind. So uh, that was uh, about the list chapter. So I will <laughs> more consider about uh, maybe the, um, the we we can solo so many group uh, uh, activity, but uh, something changed for the wide open level. Maybe that was a uh, good things. So that was about the list chapter. Okay, and. Uh, uh, about the list, so we want. I want to uh, share about. I uh, want to think about uh, something. The other thing is, uh, uh, so we know something and uh, something we can know. So next step, I thought maybe we we can think about how to uh, avoiding ignorance, and uh, we can go back to a really really famous uh, chapter is uh, chapter one. Uh, in chapter one, we also discussion about uh, something. Uh, Dao is maybe we can know, but uh, something we still can know. So uh, the chapter one say, the Dao that can be told is not uh, the internal Dao. The name that can be named is not uh, the internal name. Nameless is the uh, original heaven and earth. The name is model of the earth things. So follow this chapter, it's really, really famous. Maybe have uh, some discussion about this chapter. So I also consider about some not so more debate, some about the uh, more uh, clearly thought. So follow the uh, Chinese text, we can see the Dr. Dao Fei Chang Dao, Ming Ming Fei Chang Ming. So uh, let's uh, to discuss about uh, some point about this chapter. We also can see the many abstract conception about uh, this chapter, uh, like uh, the da, um, to the internal Dao name, internal name, uh, named, name lost, non-being, being. And uh, we can follow those abstract conception and uh, we can find one thing you want to highlight. That was, uh, the limitation of the language and the con, um, connection about the list, conscience, we, that was a limit. So we know the name is not internal name. Why? Why will we we'll discuss about that? Because uh, a lot of you want to say, uh, nameless means something people can name that. We can name that. Because why? Because uh, uh, something that people can not complete understanding horror about that. But about this, we can say uh, uh, ignorance and it's not, it's so different, uh, ignorance, 
it's, it's whole different something we couldn't know just highlight uh, something when we have some limitation so we have to know something we couldn't know so follow this thought and uh, i will go to chapter 33 and i will really do really quickly and uh, about uh, the uh, chapter uh, 33 uh lots want to say he who knows uh, others is wise he who knows himself is enlightened. So uh, this chapter want to uh, discussion about uh, the attitude or behavior of our, about uh, the people who knows why, especially uh, uh, personal collation. Why? Because you have to know yourself. Uh, that was lots uh, want to highlight. Just something you can know, something you couldn't know. So you know something you know, so you know something you couldn't know. And uh, he will say that was uh, entitlement. Yes, it's So really short <laughs> conclusion about that was uh, because we want to how uh, people can avoid the ignorance. Uh, I thought uh, follow the losses thought. You want to uh, discuss about something, something we could know, something we couldn't know. That was uh, uh, want to uh, about the least thought. That's often pursue the people whom do not easily accept the explanation of n or knowledge they take uh, for granted. Because the people cannot guarantee the, uh, a certain knowledge or inf uh, inference about the unknowledgeable. So as the chapter two, our concept or value is artificial. That means it's not uh, absolutely right. So you can see, uh, maybe we do something. Uh, we we just uh, uh, for the people. So we do all the activity, but uh, sometimes that was not uh, right things. So uh, about this, <laughs> about the follow this thought, that was a uh, uh, little bit, a little bit about my uh, research. And uh, thank you for your listening. <laughs> and thank you for your listening. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bu Hui Link. Um, uh, and I, don't know, I would like to ask the um, uh, organizers if we could maybe still have 10 minutes for a short debate. I mean, I would have a bunch of questions for everyone, but um, since I hope I will be able to discuss these issues with them in, uh, in the near future, I'm a very optimistic <laughs> person, uh, I, would, um, I would leave a question or two to the audience. Yes, I mean, uh, participants can either use the raise hand function uh, or just text their question in the chat box. Uh, and the speakers will, will understand, will reply. And as I told you, we, I mean, <laughs> uh, if participants are interested into that, they can also uh, use the general chat uh, even after the meeting. So it will remain as our classroom, let's say so. And I hope people will use this function as well. So if they are too shy, uh, this means that they can also raise their question in a written form um, in the chat cloud and the speakers can then um, reply to them afterwards all, also. But I'm still hoping that somebody maybe will um, raise a question now because we still have uh, 10 minutes or so. Then can I raise a question? But it is very difficult for me to decide uh, which one because I have several questions uh, for everybody. But maybe I will um, I will uh, try to to uh, remain on a more general level. So. Um, I would like to ask, first of all, Li Minghui, Professor Li Minghui, who is also a specialist on the modern New Confucian uh, movement, um, especially in Taiwan. What are the main differences between the 
this traditional modern uh, Confucian um, movement in Taiwan and its paradigms on the one hand and these new approaches that can be seen or could be seen in the recent years in the um, in mainland China. What are the main differences between the Confucian revival here and there? Oh, <laughs> this is uh, difficult to answer. <laughs> in five minutes, it's difficult. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> The situation in mainland China is very, very, very complicated. <laughs> there are uh, the uh, the normal no normal scholar, uh, 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 very very simple as sim simple as the research uh, in Confucianism, and also the so called uh, the uh, the mainland com Confucianism, Da Ru Xin Ru Jia, like Zhang Qin. Uh, the Chen Min, uh, these mm -hmm. these okay. people. Uh, um, I was thinking more. Sorry to interrupt you, but but I think that you agree with me that um, uh, uh, something cannot be cannot be regarded as a modern Confucian philosopher. I was yeah. thinking more um, on scholars like uh, Guo Qiyong, for instance. Yeah, Guo Qiyong. Uh, this is the, what, what I what I I say as uh, the, the, the normal scholar, <laughs> normal scholar, <laughs> no scholar. Okay. a researcher, a simple researcher. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, uh, uh, this this scholar like Zhang Qin and Chen Min has a special uh, uh, as uh, as special as uh, thesis about. Uh, mm -hmm. especially in a political philosophy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they, they, they name themselves to the political Confucianism. He, yeah. Uh, you, you know, the Jiang Xin, Jiang Xin has a, a project about uh, the, Confu, uh, the Confu, Confucian philosophy in so-called so the, the uh, uh, three, uh, 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 how how to say it? the uh, Con Confucian? Uh, I, I, have, I have a problem with the. <laughs> You can say it in Chinese. Rujiaxian, Confucian, Confucian. Uh, Constitutionalism, Lu Jia Xian Zhen. How to say? Constitutionalism, I think. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but are they also because uh, the Taiwanese modern Confucians are somehow um, building up the heritage of the Neo Confucianism from the Song and Ming dynasties? Yeah. Uh, can you can you claim the same for the modern Confucian movement in in mainland China? Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe Guo Qiyong belong to this this group. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, I I think. Uh, I I think of Jing Haifeng, for example, Jing Haifeng in Shenzhen. Uh huh. Yeah. Or some people in in the the Sun Yat-sen University, Zhongshan Dashui, uh, like like uh Chen Li Shen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. or or the yeah Chen Li Shen, I, I think so. So these approaches do exist. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Could I could I have a small question to uh, Fabian also to Professor Heubel? Uh, we still have a few minutes. <laughs> yes, and then we have two raised hands. Yeah, no, ah, so. okay. No, then I, of course, I will talk with Fabian later. <laughs> okay, so we have two questions. One from Laura Littere, our colleague here at Verientale, and a second question from Tyler Young. Uh, Laura, please. Um, thank you for this um, wonderful opportunity. And my question is actually for Professor uh, Heubel. 
um, what I wanted to ask him is like, uh, um, I think he did very well in skipping the, um, uh, the discussion about the various translation of the term chi. But I wanted to uh, um, clarify one point. Uh, he mentioned that there was this need to elaborate an answer of, um, uh, against a materialistic interpretation of the concept of chi. And my question is, uh, does this materialistic interpretation of the concept of chi uh, so popular in the 20th century, is it also an influence of the Western uh, or Western philosophical uh, systems? Shall I, may I answer now? Yes, of course, the answer is very simple. Of course, as I, as I mentioned and also discussed in the paper, uh, this is uh, under the influence of, of Western materialism and uh, dialectical materialism, the reconstruction of Chinese philosophy from a materialist perspective, which influenced the idea of Qi as material energy or material force. So Yang Rubin is actually strongly criticizing this materialistic reconstruction of, of Qi. So this is both interpretations, the kind of more idealist understanding of Qi, which is a position that rejects Qi of because of normative or moral reasons and rejects its inclusion into subjectivity and the materialistic interpretation are both strongly in influenced by Western philo philosophy. But were these interpretations popular in China or in Taiwan? Which interpretations? The ma so materialistic, I, materialistic yes, interpretation course. became very, very popular. Very popular, yes, very popular, very influential. I mean, the materialistic interpretation, very influential since the early early 20th century. And then, of course, it became a kind of official position and ideology on Chinese traditional philosophy after 1949 in the People's Republic of China. And on the other side, contemporary Neo-Confucians strongly rejected this interpretation and even criticized the importance of qi for Confucianism because of this materialistic interpretation. So there's an ideological struggle. I refer to the Cold War, the kind of Cold War background behind this discussion of qi. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dr. Letter and Professor Heibel for your answer and question. And now we have Tyler Young, who also okay. raised. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me right now? Okay. Oh, great. Uh, my name is Tyler Young and Tyler Young. Uh, actually, I'm well, now a postdoc uh, 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 research fellows in Academia Sinica as well. And uh, last year, oh no, 2020, uh, 2019, I was, I was also attended the conference at in Ljubljana. So um, actually, today's my question is uh, um, particularly to uh, Professor um, <coughs> Fabian Hoiber and maybe um, uh, Professor Ni Ming Hui also can contribute to uh, to, to the, this question. My question is quite general, and 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 now I'm going to ask is: Do you think that um, the new Confucianism? Uh, single-handedly constitute the nature or maybe you can say the essence of Taiwanese philosophy or will you consider that the new Confucianism uh, has to cooperate with the new Taoism or maybe any other school to co-institute the nature of Taiwanese philosophy because I think that I I, I have the impression from uh, from uh, Professor Professor um, Ni Ming Hui's talk uh, that I have general ideas that about the geographical definition of uh, the Taiwanese philosophy. But I also want to ask in general, 
how do we define the nature or the essence of the Taiwanese philosophy? Or maybe we can we, we may also call it this Taiwanese Hong Kong philosophy because we have the term Gang Tai Xin Yu Zha. So I just want a very general impression that uh, how do we define uh, the, the, the nature or essence of Taiwanese philosophy with different schools in Chinese philosophy in general? Thank you. Ooh, who should answer? Li Minghui, you can't get to me. I'm not going to get to you. Hello, Fabian. Now, what are you saying? I'm going to get to you. 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 I'm going to 这是这是怎样子？还是我们应该要思考跟其他的，比如说，我会不会有新道家，或者是其他的新的学派，作为一个共同构成的，呃，这个台湾哲学家或者台湾哲学这一这这这这一个概念的内涵 ？OK，OK，OK，、okay. okay, 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 uh, of course 啊、uh, ，of course， 台湾历史 philosophy includes not not only Confucianism。Uh, not only New Confucianism, also of Taoism, Buddhism. For example, Buddhism is very, very important in Taiwan. And but I think uh, uh, the the New Confucianism is the the most important a uh, uh, part of of Taiwanese uh, philosophy. But that, this is my opinion. But I think the 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 pe the people the scholar like Hong Zi Wei, uh, may maybe uh he 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 will not not agree with me. He, yeah, professor professor Hong Zi Wei has uh has has stretched uh, the Taiwanese philosophy to Japanese colonial era. But I think uh today uh. Uh, Japanese philosophy is is not a very important uh, part in in Taiwanese philosophy. Uh, Japanese philosophy also a a combination of of Japanese and the Western philosophy. I I think it, it, this is a big question. I. I I cannot very very really simple to to answer you. Maybe I can say one or two words. I think that philosophy in Taiwan has to be not reduced to classical Chinese philosophy. It has a major advantage, I think, historical advantage, because it has been open. To Western philosophy much earlier, I mean, in the 20th century after 1949, than scholarship on the Chinese mainland. So this kind of openness and, and hybridity of philosophy in Taiwan after 1949 is unique, I would say, in the Chinese-speaking world. And and there is, uh, therefore, I think, good reason to focus. And to pay much more attention to the developments in Taiwan since 1949, and of course also the relation to uh, the Republican philosophy after uh, the the re revolution in 1911. So there are uh, important aspects which are different from the development on the Chinese mainland, as I just mentioned. This kind of materialistic approach. Of course, was strongly criticized after 1949 in Taiwan and Hong Kong. So we have a very special relation, especially between Confucianism and liberalism, on the side of political philosophy, which does not exist on the mainland. So there, are, I think, are many interesting connections and constellations which produced what we now may call Taiwanese philosophy. Thank you so much for both professors. 
And if you agree, we have a last question, last raised hand by one of our guests. Aposha, I can only see the username guest Miha. So I, I have the guest also to introduce himself or her. Sorry, please. Uh, yeah, hello, can you hear me? On the, on the debate, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, on the debate on, um, on the cheese, the energy, and the, um, and the tendency to, to, to be at heart, to, to def define it in materialistic terms. I just, it, it just when um, the last speaker um, spoke, uh, I remember this. 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 Uh, she spoke of the Tao, which has, which has a name, is not Tao anymore. So, could you, could you, could, could we say that, in a sense, this, in a sense, this, um, this uh, insistence on um, defining Qi in a materialistic way is of a similar problem than trying to name the Tao and if anyone could just like saying, confirm or deny this notion that this is like the essentialism of um, some Western thought of school. Then. I, I maybe can say one, one word to this. I think that I tried to say that the materialistic aspect or a materialistic moment in qi is important to recognize. So Jan Rubin's idea is not to reject completely a materialistic interpretation of qi. It is to say that it is one-sided and that it is ideological and that we have somehow to get rid of this kind of idealistic, materialistic oppositions. So from this perspective, we can learn a lot, and he learned a lot from the materialistic interpretations of Qi. That's my okay, thing. Yes, this was exactly what I was trying to say, that, that in a sense of, you know, you discuss Taoism and its core concept Tao, and at the same time, it also states that Tao that has a name that does not have a name. So I just, just anyway, just think interesting this this notions connected together. I didn't mean to disprove of this materialistic concept. Thank you. Maybe uh, Chiara Ghidini, Professor Ghidini has a. Uh, I heard the word Japan, so I kind of thought that uh, perhaps one of the things that have been studied are related to the influence of the Kyoto School on Taiwanese philosophy. And I think Wan Jin Sui, uh, I, I know the name in Japanese, that's horrible, uh, and uh, Tanabe Hajime. So I guess also issues related to logic or to Nishida Kitaro's, uh, well, valuation of space, the concept of space. So they are maybe, uh, yeah, I mean, an arena for comparison to look at the kind of influences, perhaps. And this does, uh, of course, deprive uh, Taiwanese philosophy from its creativity. But I think that the Kyoto School must have had some kind of impact as well. That's that's all I want to say. That's all. Your question for me? <laughs> Maybe Guanmin can respond yeah. to this question. Guanmin. Honestly, well. Mm -hmm. Professor Huang. Yeah, uh, I, I think the Kyoto School, they, uh, since uh, Nishitaki Talo, um, all the uh, Japanese scholars has uh, tried to uh, incorporate the Western thought into the local uh, Japanese uh, language. So they try to uh, transform their their uh, thought on the basis of 
uh, uh, absorption of the Western concepts. So there is um, a strong tendency of uh, translation uh, into the uh, Japanese context, and they are very consciously uh, doing this. But on the contrary, the uh, for example, the neo uh, the contemporary uh, Confucian school, uh, like Xiong uh, Shili, uh, contemporary of uh, Nishida, uh, he goes back to the Chinese uh, traditions without uh, uh, massively adopting the Western uh, terminology. So uh, this difference or this divi uh, deviation uh, defines the uh, following developments. For example, in, in uh, Kyoto School, there are many generations and they keep a strong dialogue uh, with the Western scholars. So uh, their problematics are uh, quasi sim um, contemporary to the Western problematics. So, uh, but uh, the uh, Chinese philosophy uh, till now, uh, even in Taiwan, uh, there is still some lack of uh, problematic. And uh, this is the way that uh, the philosophers, the, um, the older uh, generation and younger generation uh, all try to uh, keep in touch with the uh, uh, contemporary thoughts, try to incorporate more energetically uh, the the problematics that we face, uh, we are in face uh, all together. So I, this is what I, I see, not only to take the uh, Taiwanese philosophy as something has been done, something has been established, it is something in development and in transformation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Federico, maybe uh, Oriana wants to and uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's breaking my heart. It's breaking my heart, truly. But I think we have to conclude now because you told me already that we have two hours <laughs> at most. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, the organizers again and of course also my sincere thanks to the speakers and their interesting contributions. And I would like to conclude this um, roundtable with a wish or with a sincere hope for a fruitful, fruitful uh, further development of Taiwanese philosophical research and its international uh, cooperation. So thank you really uh, very much to all of you. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Jana. Thank you, Jana. Thank you Jana. everyone. Bye -bye. And just, just, <laughs> Bye -bye. A quick, um, Bye. just a quick information, there will be the, the next event in our cycle will take place on March 16th. If you uh -huh. want to join, uh, Professor Lisa Andracolo uh, yeah. will talk about civil disobedience, disobedience, agency, and moral authority in early Chinese philosophy. Thank you. Thank you again. And Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you.